Um, welcome everyone to the two-day conference, Religion in Latin America and the Caribbean, Past, Present and Possible Futures. This is an event held by the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, CLACS, which is based at the Institute of Modern Languages Research at the School of Advanced Study, University of London. And we're organizing it in collaboration with the Center for Religion, Conflict, and Globalization at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. My name is Ainoa Montoya, and together with my colleague, Manuela Carpenedo, we're going to briefly introduce the event before moving on to the panels. We will both be around during the two days on, of the conference and look forward to the exciting panels and discussions. The event has received a fantastic response and the fact that it extends over two days is testament to that. And this has also meant that we have had to arrange some parallel sessions. So we are going to be offering um, we're going to be offering details of uh, how to join those parallel sessions at the end of the sessions, but please do double check the program to make sure you have joined the correct session. If you are a chair or a speaker, please do join the sessions 15 minutes before it starts so that we can make sure it is all working and, and set well in time. In every panel, we will be hearing from, from all the speakers and then open it up for questions and comments. Only the keynote uh, lecture by Professor Virginia Garrard later today and presentations in plenary sessions both today and tomorrow are going to be recorded where speakers have agreed to it, of course, uh, but the Q&As won't. And Please do feel free to use the chat box to either introduce yourselves or post comments and questions during the conference. Chairs will try to pick up as many questions as possible during the Q&As, and you will also be very welcome to raise your hand function and ask the question yourselves when it is your turn. Also, if you are on Twitter, uh, feel free to use the hashtag religion and luck, which we're going to post in the chat box to post your comments and be part of the same conversation. And I think this is all from me. So um, the theme of the event emerged from Manuela Carpenedo's own research interest and her involvement in CLACS as a former stipendiary fellow. So I'm going to hand it over to her to explain what the motivation behind the event is. So over to you, Manuela. Okay, uh, can you hear me well? Yeah? Okay, uh, thank you so much, Ainoa, uh, and welcome to everyone. Uh, I must say that uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here today uh, and to all the response of, to this event, yeah. Very grateful for the support of the Center for Latin American Caribbean Studies, CLACS, at the University of London, as well as the, the Center for Religion, Conflict and Globalization uh, at the University of Runyon. So in this conference, uh, we managed to combine not only one, the most important scholars in the field of religion in Latin America and the Caribbean, but also an exciting new generation of researchers bringing innovative and timely agendas to this field. So this conference was conceptualized as this interdisciplinary attempt to promote this urgent dialogue between Latin American studies and religious studies. Therefore, this interdisciplinary dialogue is one of the main aims of this conference. So anyone here that works with religion in Latin America and the, and the Caribbean knows that the variety and complexity of the religious experiences in this context forces us to cross any fixed disciplinary boundaries. Historians have to be aware of the multiplicity of forms in which vernacular religion is lived. Social scientists, on the other hand, have not only to have a solid engagement with historical sources, but also take seriously the theologies embraced by the people they study. Here, I stress the need of this, tem temporal, uh, this temporal sensitivity when examining uh, the multiple counters of religious life in Latin America and the Caribbean. From its indigenous forms of worship, Catholic colonial influences and Afro diasporic codes, 
to the more recent growth of evangelicals Pentecostals uh, in the region, we know that global entanglements characterize religious formations in this part of the globe. Therefore, we can even narrate that it's impossible to truly understand Latin America and Caribbean history without taking religion into account. As our keynote, Professor Virginia Garat, uh, together with Paul Freston and Stefan Doe have argued, it's useful to view the entire history of Latin America and the Caribbean as a religious history. I must say that I'm very excited to discuss with you the current themes of religion in Latin America and the Caribbean from this temporal perspective. In these two days of conference, we will explore themes related to religion, politics, and national imagination, uh, the importance of Afro religiosity in the continent, how religious cosmologies need to be taken into account when discussing environmental issues. In the second day, we will debate how digital technologies are transforming religiosity, themes related to religion and urban contexts, religious conversion, and the trans transnationalization of Latin American Caribbean religiosity, and as well as essential themes uh, related to gender, sexuality, and religion. We will fi finalize our conference by investigating how uh, the recent decolonial turn in the humanities and social sciences has been contributing to the new insights about religiosity in, in the continent. We will start our conference with the first plenary session entitled Religion and Political Mobilization, which will be chaired by Professor uh, Joanil Duburici. Uh, Professor uh, Joanil Duburici is a social scientist of religion and trained political scientist. He is a researcher at the Joaquin Nabucco Foundation and professor of the Fe Federal, uh, Federal University of Pernambuco, where he teaches sociology and political science. His work is dedicated to explore the connections between religion, politics, identity, culture, policy making, and democratic governance. Well, now I open the floor to Professor Joanil Duburici. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manuela. Uh, a very warm welcome to everyone. Um, this is good morning from where I am in Northeast Brazil. Uh, good afternoon for those who are in the UK and perhaps good evening to some other people farther east. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and I am, we are going to run this session on religion and political mobilization. Uh, there are three papers uh, listed. We are going to start with uh, Gerson Leite de Moraes and Daniel Francisco Nagal Menezes. They're both from the uh, Presbyterian University, Mackenzie. Um, Dr. Gerson is going to speak. Uh, I think he is going to make the presentation, but this is a, a joint uh, authorship. He's going to uh, present uh, on the approximation between militia power and religious fundamentalism in Brazil. The current crisis of the Brazilian Republic. Uh, Professor Moraes is, uh, has a double uh, PhD, one in sciences of religion from the Pontifical uh, Catholic University in Sao Paulo, and another one in philosophy from the University of Campinas. He's a professor of the postgraduate program in education, art, and history of culture at the Presbyterian University, Mackenzie, or Mackenzie Presbyterian University in Sao Paulo. And uh, Dr. Daniel uh, Menezes has a PhD in law from the uh, Presbyterian University, Mackenzie um, uh, Presbyterian University, and he's um, a professor of the postgraduate program in political and economic law at the Presbyterian University. So uh, you have the floor. I understand we should allow, say, 20 minutes for each presentation so we can have uh, enough time for questions and answers in the end. So please, uh, Gerson, you've got the floor. Good morning or good afternoon to all present. Uh, we would like uh, to thank you for the opportunity to present our paper at this Congress. Uh, the title 
uh, of our paper is the approximation between militia power and religious fundamentalism in Brazil, the current crisis of the Brazilian Republic. Others, me, Gerson Leite de Moraes, and my friend, Dr. Daniel Francisco Nagal Menezes. Mm. Um problema aqui para compartilhar. Vocês estão vendo? Sim? Tá Sim. mudando aqui. Sim, Gerson. Mas não está mudando de slide. É. Travou. Tira e põe de novo, Gerson. Ah. Tenta mudar, é... Agora foi? Vocês estão vendo? Sim. Sim, sim. Ok. Uh, the health crisis at COVID-19 showed a spurious relationship between a parallel power of militias in Brazil and the religion's fundamentalism practiced by some sectors of the so-called evangelical church in the country. The president of Brazil, Mr. Jair Messias Bolsonaro, legitimately represented by an intuitive neo-fascism and necropolitics, has long had his name associated with the militias, paramilitary groups generally commanded by ex-military, who dispute with drug trafficking the common conflagrate areas, mainly in the states of Rio de Janeiro. And since he reached the prisoners of the Republic, winning the 2018 elections with the support of fundamentalist religious groups, he has attacked democratic institutions, threatening to institute a dictatorship. As a faithful and therefore poor finished cop of Donald Trump, he has catalyzed the power of the both militias and religious fundamentalists to his coup ideals. The objective of this work is to map and analyze the role of these two institutions and their main leaders who through the, the use of robots and using a true digital militia financed with public money, promote disinformation, spreading fake news in combat the coronavirus pandemic, and has been the loyal base of support for the Jair Bolsonaro government. Evermore cornered and committing countless crimes of responsibility, which can lead to punishment both internally and internationally, Jair Bolsonaro reinforces his militia agendas and uses religion in an instrumental way to avoid political impeachment and, consequently, his imprisonment. Our paper is structured in three parts. Uh, uh, first part, the historical elective affinities between fascism and religious fundamentalism in Brazil. Uh, second part, Brazil and the power of the militia, the neo-fascism intuitive and necropolitics. Third part, uh, Jair Bolsonaro and the religions in the pandemic evangelical leadership and their own interests. Next, uh, I will summarize uh, these parties. Uh, there have long been uh, affinities between fascism and fundamentalism in Brazil. 
For example, an American fundamentalist pastor, Carl McIntyre, in 1956 arrived in Brazil, uh, bringing $25,000 to anxious to disseminate the fundamentalism to the a church leadership Presbyterian of Brazil at time. Quote, just you get together some leaders, others they will follow his leadership and for spiritual zeal, they will do anything. Uh, close quotes. Uh, we highlight three affinities between fascism and fundamentalism in Brazil. The first is idyllic romanticization of the past and tradition. For fundamentalists and fascists, the ideal past is something to be recovered. It serves as a beacon. The present day, they are bad because the values of the past are abundant. Uh, the second characteristic that units fundamentalists and fascists is about our and leftists. Uh, thirdly and lastly, it can be said uh, that there is a need for both movements of finding a leader to be adored. In fascist Italy, the Duce, he was the supreme leader, the mat. Uh, that gave direction to his man. In the religious fundamentalism, Jesus is generally railed uh, as the great leader. But in fact, fundamentalists do, who, do, do follow the pastors who have become celebrates for being televangel televangelists or internet YouTubers. Uh, em... Oi. Você não quer parar o slide? Continuar só com a apresentação? Não está passando, então. Ah. Acho que fica uh... melhor para você. Ok. Uh, in the second part of our paper, we explore uh, Brazil and power of militia. Uh, the new fascism, intuitive and necropolitics. Uh, fascism is a discourse of coercion. Freud, in your book, Mass Psychology, suggests that this speech is capable of hypnotizing. Uh, Roland Barthes looks at uh, this model of fascist discourse is torture, in which the torturer, through the pain of torture, progressively leads him to confess what the torturer wants to hear. The fascist torturing attitude can manifest itself on several levels. He, as in the proposal from our uh, military aid schools, religion sects, and physical territory itself. Every that uh, on the other is object of your control. Bolsonaro did not read the fascist theorists. His education is rudimentary and his actions are intuitive. Uh, recently, Bolsonaro's letters to new Nazi groups were discovered. Uh, quote, every feedback I get from communications becomes a stimulus for my work. You are the reason for my exams mandate. Close quotes. Uh, in uh, other image, President Jair Bolsonaro found outside the official agenda, agenda 
with German uh, DPAD Beatrix von Storch, one of the leaders of the far right party, Alternative for Germany, and granddaughter of former finance minister of Germany during the regime Nazi. Uh, in the third part of our paper, we explore Jair Bolsonaro and the religions at pandemic, Catholics and Evangelics, no? uh, fundamentalists, pastors, priests, and uh, adherents of uh, prosperity theology. Uh, religious that support Bolsonaro government. Uh, we have uh, four pastors uh, of church uh, evangelicals. Uh, first, Edir Macedo from Universal Church of the Kindle of God said that uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, that the virus was just a strategy for a Satan, uh, and the people would not need to worry. Got COVID, vaccinated in the United States. The second, Valdemir Santiago from the World Church of Power of God, came to sell magic beans that create COVID. Uh, COVID. Lost a brother from, uh, lost a brother to the virus. Third, uh, Silas Malafaya, the shirtless of all. Also got uh, COVID, but uh, recovered. He did campaign uh, for the opening of the church in the moment of the toast actions, the isolation social. Your calendar is available to President. R. R. Suarez from the International Church of Grace uh, of God, classified as spiritual counselor of the President, information given by the son of the Bolsonaro. Uh, he picked up uh, COVID and recovered in one of the best hospital in Rio de Janeiro. We will believe this is what uh, we have to present. This is the summary of our presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. We move on then to our second speaker. Am I right to uh, pronounce your name, Johanna? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh Right. So, Johanna Perez Gomez, she will present um, her paper on the spiritual war, paramilitary, sorcery, and the rising of Pentecostalism in Colombia. Um, she has a master's in anthropology and cultural politics from Goldsmiths uh, University and is a PhD candidate in anthropology at the University College London. Her research focuses on armed groups, use of sorcery in Colombia, specifically paramilitary groups, uh, use of rituals to acquire supernatural powers. And uh, we will be hearing more about that through her presentation. So please, Johanna, you are welcome and uh, you can start your presentation now. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to share with you uh, a a fragment of uh, the last chapter of my thesis. So um, there is still very much a uh, work in progress. Um, there are too many elements, so I'm just going to dive in and, and read. Um, as, as you mentioned, uh, my thesis explores uh, one sorcery practice that was widely used by paramilitary groups at the time of their expansion in the Eastern Plains, one of the largest jet list research uh, regions in Colombia. My thesis analyzes uh, this sorcery or brujeria in Spanish that paramilitaries used to become bulletproof and acquire supernatural strength. Uh, this practice is called to get cruzados, 
and was very popular particularly uh, among the lower ranks in the groups. I analyzed uh, throughout my thesis how this practice frame the different aspects of paramilitary power and how they capture the historical significance of their violent expansion in that region. Uh, I just want to uh, give you a little bit of context about paramilitaries because it can get confused. Um, paramilitaries uh, have different or origins in Colombia, but um, usually uh, people refer to paramilitary groups uh, to talk about the counter-insurgency counter groups uh, defending uh, the elites, the regional elites, from the threat posed by communist guerrillas uh, that were gaining popularity in the 1970s. Paramilitaries blossomed towards the 1980s when they accessed vast profits of drug traffic money. These groups expanded throughout the 1990s and 2000s and controlled vast territories of Colombia, progressively taking over the drug traffic business and controlling even local elections. At the height of their military power in 2005, the two largest paramilitary groups entered a peace process with the Colombian government that ended in the demobilization of hundreds of combatants. Despite this demobilization, new paramilitary structures have emerged and continue to control the territories. Paramilitaries perpetuate not as an organization, but rather as a process, and I'm quoting, a process, a mechanism, a political an economic project of domination, in the words of anthropologist Aldo Civico, whose quote I just led you here for a bit of context. So um, I did field work in a, a small town in the Inster Plains, and I follow demobilized combatants, uh, ex cruzados around, and I came to know, and uh, this was a discovery I was not prepared to in the field, but I came to know that many of them had become Christianos as people call uh, evangelical Pentecostals in Colombia. They have been subjected to deliverance ceremonies uh, to exorcise the demons that were, um, that were attracted by the use of sorcery, uh, they, um, the, the use of sorcery to get cruzado. So this is uh, actually the odd chapter in my thesis because all the previous thesis has been uh, dealing with cruzado sorcery and paramilitary power. And it's entirely based in, in this new discovery. So the chapter contends that Pentecostals resignify cruzado sorcery and integrated as combatants recodifying their experience of sorcery and war in the theological concept of the spiritual war. I argue that this is one of the ways in which these religious communities have successfully harmonized with the world emerging after the consolidation of paramilitarism, after the consolidation of this project of domination, as a Civico proposed. This war is one of extreme neoliberal restructuring uh, of the regions, and as I will describe in this presentation, a war of highly polarized political climate. So, um, as I, you can see, I'm not going to be talking a lot about sorcery. I'm sorry if I disappoint some of you, uh, but I'm going to focus now in, um, in, in how and what these uh, Pentecostal churches offer to uh, ex combatants, ex, um, ex paramilitaries. Um, one of the ways in which uh, the literature have understood this. Uh, this appeal, the appeal that these churches have for these uh, ex-combatants is um, this idea that they offer a clean break, a walkout from this previous life of paramilitary groups, and particularly for what, what um, anthropologist um, Bordek, Bordek called uh, the male prestige arenas. They offer them a place so they can cut with this uh, ethics of a street life, uh, bars, partying, alcohol consumption. Um, on the other corner of, of this idea that they will offer this clean break with uh, the, the life of the groups is uh, the idea that they um, that has been researched in Brazil by uh, anthropologist Da Cunha and uh, Professor De Moraes that was suggesting this kind of continu contiguity between the life in the groups and the life as um, Christianos. So I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about that. Um, Unfortunately, um, I did not have the opportunity to explore a cooperation of the type described by Cunha. Um, 
that uh, I couldn't document alliance between active paramilitaries and churches because it was a very dangerous task that would have required an approach to the field that I did not have at the time. So given my limitations to collect materials as an ethnographer, I focused on another type of approximation between Pentecostals and uh, armed groups. Um, in the ideological and their ideological deployment of the spiritual war, a theological concept projected into multiple directions in a country where there is still actual war. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about this spiritual war. Why? Uh, I should now explain. Um, in my field site, ex-paramilitaries involvement with Pentecostal churches usually starts in deliverance ceremonies, which were particularly important for Crusados who were suffering from spirit possession after the mobilization. Deliverance ceremonies orientate perception of the demonic as omnipresent. They reveal the war as a site of redemptive struggle, staging the, spirit, staging the spiritual war, an eternal battle against demonic forces that menace all aspects of human existence, from health to prosperity and national security. Revelation of the spiritual war fills the faithful with a powerful sense of agency by transforming them in direct bearers of divine grace and by holding them accountable for fighting their opponents, demons, war endangering antagonists to defeat. I am the warrior of God, in quotes, is a common expression of Pentecostals to describe their new life. The personal revelation of the spiritual war is a foundational truth in words of Comarot, projected towards all fields of social life and propelling Pentecostal religious militancy. The spiritual war offered ex-combatants a vehicle for fighting, to keep fighting society's demons, for the good of the nation and for the good of humanity. The mobilized paramilitaries found in the spiritual war a militant quest for the implementation of a moral order built upon the nuclear conventional family, heterosexuality, a free market and free market economy. While this has been the case for most believers, this religious subjectivity was particularly important for ex-combatants and, as I suspect, for active paramilitaries. Um, I'm going to talk to about uh, the politics of the spiritual war, which is a fragment that um, as an exploration with which I end my thesis. Uh, like Pentecostals in Brazil, uh, the warriors of God and ma are more combative than Catholic activists when it comes to fight demons in political arenas. One telling example of this combativeness of Pentecostals in Colombia is the aggressive campaign against the same-sex partners' rights to adopt, for which these churches collected 2.3 million signatures for a referendum. 2.3 million signatures, that's quite a lot. Also, the referendum uh, was ultimately judged unconstitutional. The campaign ample, ample popular support was the beginning of a wide alliance between evangelism and the conservative political spectrum. This alliance consolidated during the campaigns objecting the peace agreement with the FARC guerrillas. In 2016, they, after extensive peace talks for an agreement that would put an end to 60 years of armed conflict with the communist FARC guerrillas, the then president Juan Manuel Santos wished to rally support for the agreement with a referendum. Huge mistake, by the way. Uh, many Pentecostal churches uh, run a campaign against it predicated on the basis that the peace deal promoted a so-called gender ideology. Sociologist Bartel summarizes this evangelic notion as he follows. A socialist praxis that will permit constitutional amendments that will consecrate abortion, same-sex marriage, same-sex couple adoption rights, and will threaten the very social fabric of the nation. Close quotations. Like the referendum against the same-sex couple adoption rights, Pentecostals ran the aggressive campaign using the template of the spiritual war. They were campaigning against the demons lurking in the gender ideology of the peace agreement. Their objection helped to the victory of the no. 
promoted by the right-wing political bloc alliance, allied against the peace agreement. Um, the weight of Pentecostal participation in the victory of the no is still to be revised, yet their campaign is telling about born-again Christians a strong sense of empowerment, which propelled them to respond to God's call to wrestling their country from the threats of demons, communism, progressive agenda, agendas, and liberal humanism, all the same. As the words of Pastor Cesar Castellanos after the Voldeno campaign clearly shows, quotations, we, nosotros, we saved Colombia from the being handed over to communists. We saved Colombia from the destructive power of the spirits of homosexuality. We saved the traditional family. We saved Colombia from the ideology of homo Castro chavismo, exclaimed the pastor of the Mission Charismatica Internacional, MCI, at a convention in Los Angeles. As I mentioned before, this sense of activism in time, as come out of call it, is particularly appealing to those like ex-paramilitaries who find in the spiritual world a way to continue fighting against the spirits of homosexuality and the threat of Castro Chavismo, as the socialist idea behind Cuban and Venezuelan governments are called by right-wing politicians in Colombia. While, Pente while Pentecostalismo is not necessarily aligned with the political right, as it has been uh, researched in, in Nicaragua and in, in Brazil. Uh, in Colombia, churches align with the right political spectrum. Like Pentecostals supporting Pinochet in Chile to fight the demons of communism, most Pentecostal discourses in Colombia conflate communism, progressive movements and left-wing parties with the demonic reality they must fight against. In doing so, they channel the anti-communist sentiment that constituted the earlier base of paramilitarism popular support in the 1980s. They fix, Pentecostal churches fix this sentiment in the spiritual world, a transcendental reality transposed to Colombian polarized political climate in a country torn by 60 years of armed conflict. Moreover, fixing the spiritual world in this way resembles paramilitary attempts to impose a normative order through the massacres known as limpiezas of social or social cleansings, where they sought to eradicate at gunpoint what they deem moral evils, incarnated in homosexualities, homeless people, indecent women, seen as any progressives or left wing political associations. Lim so limpiezas had consequences for the region's political economy, they were, as Civico describes, a distinct paramilitary modus operandi where the group sought to impose a normative order by cleaning society for undesirable individuals, not only defined in relation to a political ideology, but to a conservative ethos. Limpiezas, spiking in the history of paramilitarism between 1997 and 2003, left for example, a great number of victims among the LGTB community, a history that still have to be told. While Pentecostal churches offer ex-combatants a walkout, the spiritual war enabled them a degree of continuity with, the, with a degree of continuity with the conservative discourses, the de facto ideology behind some of the most despicable violence of paramilitary limpiezas. So I want to talk to you, um, okay, no, continue, sorry. The two churches I visited in my field site, attended by many demobilized paramilitaries and their, and their families, campaigned for the Christian political party Fair and Free Colombia, Colombia Justa y Libre, from which you can see the logo in the slide. Uh, they campaigned for this party in the elections in 2018. The party was founded in 2017 by the political movement Afri Colombia and the party Affair Colombia, notorious supporters of the No campaign in the referendum to sanction the peace agreements. Fair and Free Colombia reunite the largest number of evangelical denominations in the country, including some charismatic Catholic communities. I observed the pastors actively campaigning for this party. 
organizing informative meetings with the extended church community and managing committees for distributing promotional materials to rural areas. The churches functioned as, a, as the party headquarters in the town during the 2018 electoral race. The, the party managed to put uh, 14 mayors, three senators in parliament, mobilizing more than half a million votes. Together with the, the Christian political party Mira, Fair and Free Colombia make Pentecostal churches a political force to be reckoned with. This was evidence for the right-wing presidential candidates who disputed their support, which was finally won by the candidate of the Democratic, uh, the Democratic Centre Party, Ivan Duque. Uh, by supporting Duque, Fair and Free Colombia ratified their support of Uribismo, populism centralized on the figure of Alvaro Uribe and characterized by a strong anti-communist anti sentiment. At the head of the Democratic Centre Party, Álvaro Uribe, the twice president of Colombia and mentor of President Duque, has a political career seriously suspected of links with paramilitarism. Uribe rose to power by promising to defeat military the FARC guerrillas, and once in office, he broke a peace process that benefited paramilitary groups. To date, more than 59 of his political allies were sent, are sentenced to jail time for their ties with paramilitary groups. Moreover, as documented in a plethora of journalistic investigations and in some of the 276 ongoing investigations leveled against him, Uribe, Uribe apparently has nexus with paramilitary groups, the Colombian and the Mexican mafia. Despite all of this, Uribe yields a great political power that extends towards different sectors of society, including a great part of Pentecostal communities. Fair, Fair and Free Colombia, the largest Pentecostal coalition in Colombia, campaigned with the Democratic Center Party and became a strategic ally of Uribismo. Although there are dissenting voices within the churches and the disastrous Duque administration has made Uribismo popular appeal, Pentecostals in Fair and Free Colombia support the caudillo. In doing so, they blend with the paramilitary shadow that this populism cast over Colombian politics are over the country peace building efforts. The political activity of Pentecostal churches under Fair and Free Colombia demonstrates how this is spiritual, how the spiritual war uh, propels a religious militancy that have ramifications in various political arenas. As I have shown, Pentecostal social conservatism and anti-communist ideology has become a key for a right-wing political coalition, dynamizing the spiritual world to align with Uribism. This is not to say that Pentecostal churches in Colombia overlook or promote paramilitary violence, or that cooperate with armed organizations that is documented by Da Cunha in Brazil. It means that their theological concept of the spiritual war echoes the neoconservative discourses comprised in the Uribismo, catapulting, catapulting Pentecostal churches into national political arenas suspected of links with paramilitarism and thus with the narco state that is today Colombia. My exploration suggests that the spiritual war takes a spectacular proportions for ex combatants in a country torn apart by decades. One minute, please, your Okay, yeah, I, I'm about to finish. Two, two, yeah, two parallels. Oh, okay, so. My exploration suggests that the spiritual war takes spectacular proportions for its combatants in a country torn apart by decades of political violence. However, this is no new or confined to Colombia. The spiritual war is part of Pentecostalism theological politics and its muscular Christianity, in the words of Komarov, Komarov aligned with fundamentalism's need to confront uh, the secular war. It is a powerful way to do politics in times of extreme political polarization. To conclude, and skipping some bits, um, there is no work about spirituality, religion, and violence in Colombia complete without looking at the Pentecostal phenomena. Like in other parts of Latin America, Pentecostal churches are on the rising in the cities as well as in the small towns, like where I did my fieldwork. 
Further research is needed to understand how this rising occurs in contexts pervaded by the presence of armed groups who yield great, great economic and political power across, across the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johanna. So we are going now to move on to our third and last paper in this session. It's going to be presented by Luciana Chamorro Elizondo. Uh, she is uh, from the University of Michigan and her paper is titled Theopolitics and the Economy of Hate in Post-Revolutionary Nicaragua. Uh, Luciana is a political anthropologist who specializes in Central America and writes on revolution and its afterlives, populist politics, authoritarianism, effect, and aesthetics. She's preparing a book uh, called Afterlives of Revolution, Authoritarian Populism and Political Passions in Post-Revolutionary Nicaragua, which examines populist governance and effective attachments to the Sandinista political project. So she's going to, uh, she has a PhD in anthropology from Columbia University, uh, a recent one. And after graduating, she was a Mellon postdoctoral research associate at um, the University of Arizona. So Luciana, you've got the floor, 20 minutes. Thank you and welcome. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, greetings to everybody from Central America. Um, I, I will just go ahead and um, read this, this small paper that I, this short paper that I've prepared, which is also a work in progress. So I will appreciate any comments and questions that you may have about it. Um, okay. So in April of 2018, thousands of Nicaraguans came out to the streets in protest of an IMF mandated austerity reform to the social security system passed by President Daniel Ortega by way of presidential decree. In response, police, unidentified snipers, and third force groups of Sandinista supporters violently confronted the demonstrations, killing 54 people in the span of four days and igniting a nationwide uprising demanding Ortega's resignation and justice for the families of those who had been killed. In the midst of uprising, uh, First Lady and Vice President Rosario Murillo denounced that Nicaragua was being hit by, quote, a diabolical terrorist wave. She called demonstrators vampires with tiny hearts that, doing the work of hate, want to poison us all and fill Nicaragua with hate. The work of hate, she said, was returning to Nicaragua to, quote, a violence that we thought was buried. Moreover, she argued that those doing the work of hate were committing, quote, crimes against the family, against youth, against the fatherland that has cost us so much to unite, to reconcile, and to transcend the resentment proper of wars. She prayed to God to remove, quote, the toxicity, envy, and ambition that was producing hate in the hearts of her political opponents and called on government supporters and Sandinista families to initiate a chain of prayers against hate. Public servants, including police and uh, municipal workers, the same actors that had been involved in the violent repression of protest, organized prayer groups in, the work in their workplaces and in public spaces. In some cases, evangelical pastors joined in to lift spirits and banish hatred from Nicaragua. This was not the first time that prayer groups had been called forth by the Sandinista National Liberation Front in its struggle against political adversaries. In 2008, one year after Ortega had returned to power, the roundabouts of Nicaragua's capital became a contested political space. Former revolutionary commander Dora Maria Telles staged a hunger strike at the edges of the Ruendario roundabout in protest of the illegal cancellation of her dissident political party by Daniel Ortega's government. In the weeks that followed, as her strike was turning into a larger protest movement, Managua woke to new permanent occupants of the city's roundabouts. A pink banner stylized in the form of government propaganda with yellow letters and the Managua municipal logo announced prayers against hate. Behind it, a group of elderly men and women stood facing passing cars with their hands raised, invoking the Lord and bringing down prayers to rid Nicaragua of evil. Prayer groups 
uh, were organized in 24 hour shifts, equipped with Bibles, municipality tents, porta potties, and meal deliveries. They prayed against hate for months on end. Um, and informally, they became known as the Rezadores. Different versions of prayer groups emerged uh, throughout the years. On August 4th of 2008, a mobile unit of Rezadores perched itself in front of the Swedish embassy with photos of Ambassador Eva Sederberg with devil's horns. After she had gone on TV and commented on Dora Maria's hunger strike, intimating that democracy was not being fully respected in Nicaragua. A similar group came to picket outside the newsroom of Channel 2, where the interview with Setterberg had taken place. Uh, that year, Rezadores also visited the offices of Nicaragua's autonomous women's movement after prominent members spoke up against the banning of abortion by the Ortega regime. More than a cynical um, an instrumental adoption of religious rhetoric and imagery for political gain, prayer groups became one expression of a broader political phenomenon, the invigoration of political antagonisms by way of morally charged rhetoric of a struggle between the forces of love and hate. When the 2008 municipal election results were disputed by the opposing political party, the FSLN mobilized its followers along with third-hand force primarily recruited from Manawa's urban informal settlements, which is the place where I do my field work, um, armed with bats, rocks, and chains to oppose any public demonstrations of dissent. These groups wore FSLN t-shirts that bore the same slogan as the Rezadores, love is stronger than hate. This slogan became central to Sandinismo in its post-revolutionary moment condensing the FSLN's efforts to revive revolutionary passions by new means. When considering the relationship between populism and religion, scholars have argued that religion can be hijacked by populist leaders to build a shared cultural ground in their attempts to unify otherwise heterogeneous populations. Nicaraguan sociologists have made similar arguments, proposing that the uses of religious discourses and imagery by the FSLN in the post-revolutionary moment is about reflecting the overwhelmingly Christian and increasingly neo-Pentecostal beliefs and identities of the Nicaraguan people, a corrective to the revolution's open conflict with the Catholic Church. Writing in the European context, Andrew Arato and Jean Cohen have offered a different perspective arguing that more than a shared and homogenizing cultural, cultural identity, religious discourses provide, quote, a convincing moral claim to trigger the self-righteous indignation necessary to construct, define, and mobilize the, the authentic good people against the alien other. In other words, they argue that religion offers populists a means to arouse adversarialism through the pro production of a moralizing sensibility, particularly in contexts where other host ideologies for populism are unavailable. Following this line of thought, I, I argue that the uses of religious discourse and imagery in Nicaragua by Sandinismo um, are intimately tied to an effort to invigorate political antagonisms in a context in which the FSLN has espoused the process of neoliberalization neoliber and can no longer galvanize Nicaraguans by promising a moral path of justice and equality. In her essay, Resisting Left Melancholia, Wendy Brown argues that in addition to a series of losses associated with the disintegration of socialist regimes around the world, the left has lost the promise of moral certainty. For Brown, moral certainty is a fundamental source of enjoyment for the left a condition for our self-love as leftists and our fellow feelings towards other leftists. Brown argues that in response to this unavowed loss, the left has remained permeated by melancholic attachment, invested in preserving its own passions and reasons, more so than in finding new means to enact justice and equality. In prior texts, Brown had already elaborated on the attachment to the feeling of righteousness rather than to the professed aims of the left, arguing that when, quote, when the telos of the good vanishes, but the yearning for it remains, morality appears to devolve into moralism in politics. 
she defines moralism in distinction to morality as, quote, a remnant of a discourse whose heritage and legitimacy it claims, while in fact inverting that discourse's sense and sensibility. At the extreme, moralism may be seen as a kind of posture or pose taken up by, in the ruins of morality by its faithful adherents, an impoverished substitute for or reaction to the evisceration of a sustaining moral vision. It is expressed through the adoption of combative postures of moral judgment in the absence of a full-fledged moral apparatus and vision. It's a form of anti-politics precisely because it reshapes revolutionary doctrines into, quote, brittle, defensive, and finally conservative institutions and practices. The FSLN's responses to its internal and public crisis after the loss of power in 1990 are symptomatic of what Wendy Brown calls left melancholia. In many respects, the FSLN had maintained an obstinate attachment to ideas of revolutionary conviction grounded in the register of sacrifice and sacrificial love as fundamental uh, form of political action and through it on the production of debt and obligation to Sandinismo. This impulse to grasp the last comforting uh, frame in the unraveling narrative, as Brown suggests, leads to one form of moralism that renders the critique of Sandinismo as a form of injury and the defense of Sandinismo, despite its many contradictions, into an identity. But melancholia is not only expressed in the continued attachment to past narratives and glories. The crisis of Sandinismo has also led to the pursuit of new grounds in which to anchor political passions. In its new times, Sandinismo has elaborated a discourse saturated with invocations of Christianity, family values, and the power of love, love against the forces of evil that seeks to overcome Sandinista melancholia, but ultimately replaces Sandinismo's moral vision with a reproachful moralizing sensibility. This new aesthetic, sentimental, and rhetorical economy promises Sandinismo the renewal at the same time that it preserves the experience of moral righteousness that was once secured by the teleology of revolution. In a longer version of this paper, I, tra I trace the genealogy of Sandinismo, its ethical crisis after the 1990 electoral defeat, and its efforts to anchor itself in a new moralistic project of love infused with pan-Christian overtones. This crisis involved the scandalous corruption of Sandinista leadership who enriched themselves in the reprivatization of previously socialized land and other public resources in 1990, which was compounded by a more general devaluation of the ideas of martyrdom and sacrifice that the revolution had been dependent upon. But perhaps the most important ethical crisis Sandinismo underwent was Soy la America Ortega Murillo's public denouncement of her stepfather, Daniel Ortega, for sexually abusing and assaulting her since she was 11 years old. In public, Ortega's wife and current vice president, Rosario Murillo played a fundamental role in efforts to salvage Ortega's image, overperforming family unity and family values, arguing that the matter was a private affair and should be dealt with as such. Together, Ortega and Murillo courted the leadership of the Catholic Church and evangelical pastors, supporting a total ban on abortion and becoming married after several decades together. At the same time that they forged a timely alliance, with Nicaragua's traditional economic elites that had previously opposed the Sandinista Popular Revolution. The new Sandinista proposition to the Nicaraguan people resonated uh, with a broader expansion in the ethical offering that was taking place in Nicaragua at the time of neoliberalization in the 1990s and early 2000s. If Sandinismo in the revolutionary moment espoused liberation theology's premise, qualifying exploitation and inequality as a sin, and declaring it a moral ob obligation to change those structures, Sandinismo now turned to so-called family values to develop a notion of love that was compatible with, and in some, some would argue even found, found foundational to ne neoliberal individualism. Murillo elaborated a discourse that incorporated the you know, Pentecostal promise of prosperity and the idea of spiritual warfare at the same time that it promoted positive thinking and the cultivation of the self as the most important uh, strategy for the transformation of humanity, 
all without having to come to terms with the structures that consecrate inequality and everyday suffering in, in Nicaragua. And the degree to, of the takeover of religion, uh, just to give one note, is we can, one example is that in, for the 2019 anniversary of the Sandinista Popular Revolution, one of the key kind of uh, guests that was invited was Ralph Drollinger, who is Trump's Bible studies professor or Bible studies teacher. And he was invited to Nicaragua in the center stage uh, because he was seeking to open uh, like Bible studies, uh, re, uh, Bible studies uh, centers within the National Assembly in Nicaragua. That's just an aside. <laughs> But beyond the, an effort to reinvigorate Sandinismo by charting a new path for ethical being and conduct, the new religiously inflected Sandinista discourse served to redefine the boundaries of the political community, defining political adversaries in terms that superseded the Sandinista, anti-Sandinista polarization of the past. In the new times, the political community appear, appears as always under threat no longer by US empire or capitalism, although these figures return at times, but by hatred itself. The attribution of hatred to Sandinismo's others seeks to bind the political community together in a specific way. Sarah Ahmed has argued in a different context that emotions in politics work not only to produce a shared object of love, as in Freud's model of identification, but also by aligning people with others through a shared feeling against others. She flips the Hegelian theory of desire for recognition to argue that the subject is not simply constituted by being recognized by the other. For her, the act of recognizing others is also central to the constitution of the subject. Hate in particular works, she argues, by establishing a performative loop. The other is seen as the cause of the shared emotional response that the group feels and that binds them together. In reading the other as being hateful, the subject is filled up with hate, which is in turn interpreted as a sign of the truth of that reading. Ahmed also argues that the emotion of hate works to animate the ordinary subject to bring that fantasy of threat to life by constituting the ordinary as in crisis and the ordinary person as a victim. In this, it recreates something of the temporality of revolution. It's out of the ordinariness that excites. In her daily addresses to the nation, Murillo use, uses different theories to explain what kind of other is threatening the political community. At times, Murillo will describe the malady not as a moral lack, but as something extimate that holds, that takes hold of her adversaries, causing them to, to hate. Um, in the most extreme, as was the case during the 2018 protests, she locates a, a kernel of evil within the hearts of adversaries, making hate impossible to extricate and proposing a theory of radical difference. These distinctions are important. They mark the extent to which New Sandinismo's others have the potential to be included or not into the political community. In the 2018 context, the FSLN arrived at the conclusion that the threat of contagion, contagion posed by hate could only be re really disposed of by eliminating the bodies that held the kernel of evil. A small group of Sandinista militants heeded the call for a violent defense of Sandinismo. Retired officers of the Sandinista Revolutionary Army of the 1980s, along with the Sandinista militants, active police officers in plain clothes, state employees, and self-identified Sandinista youth members marched through the streets carrying military caliber weapons and the Sandinista flag, attack, attacking roadblocks that had, were defended by slingshots, homemade Molotovs, and mortars. Uh, the so-called cleanup operation to forcibly remove barricades was advertised in the official media as a liberation struggle. With the title, Monimbo Masaya, Territorio Liberal, official media outlet, El 19 Digital, profoundly, uh, pr sorry, proudly shared images of these groups along with the special forces of the police working in unison. By the time the regime forcibly removed all barricades, over 325 people had been killed. Hundreds more were persecuted as terrorists and tens of thousands had fled the country. The SFSLN presented itself as a victimized but morally superior 
yet always victorious, righteous organization, ridding Nicaragua of the diabolical forces of evil. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Luciana, uh, for your presentation. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, we are in our panel three, uh, Religion and Environment. For me, it's a pleasure to, to present our chair, Nayo Gerati. He's a Leverhulme Fellow and lecturer in Latin America uh, and Cultural Studies at the University College London. His research focused on the intersections between critical theory, politics, and contemporary Latin American pro cultural production. Uh, his Leberhum project involves a radical re-examination re of the work of the Argentine artist Leon Ferrari, which explores the interrelations between politics and religions in the 20th century uh, in Argentina. Niall, it's a pleasure to have you as a chair. Oh, your, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Manuela. Um, it's quite nice to, to get an introduction just to chair. Um, anyways, I'm really looking forward to this panel on religion and environment. It's uh, uh, such a pressing issue for all of us. And um, we have four really excellent papers. Um, so our speakers will have 15 minutes each, and then we'll, we'll go into our question uh, session after that. So our first speaker is Ainoa Montoya. She's Senior Lecturer and Director of the Centre for Latin American and Caribbean studies our hosts here at the University of London and she's the author of the book The Violence of Democracy Political Life in Postwar El Salvador and she's also a co-editor of the Bulletin of Latin American Research which I'm sure many of you know as the journal um, for the Society for Latin American Studies here in the UK and her paper today is titled The Earth as a Common Home Political History and Ecotheology in Central America so over to you Ainoa. Thanks, Neil. So my paper is a work in progress on the relationship between discursive practices that invoke the commons and contemporary Catholic social teaching in the context of opposition to industrial mining in Central America. And it is part of a research project that explores how environmental disputes are increasingly channeled through legal arenas, as well as the various ontologies and moralities that those involved in the disputes bring to them. And one of the moral schemas that I have identified as commonplace among peasant and rural populations of Central America who do not self-identify as indigenous is the call to care for the earth as articulated by the papal encyclical Laudato Si on care for our common home. So my presentation focuses on El Salvador and I begin with a few quotes which I then weave into the rest of my presentation. And the first quote corresponds to some extra extracts from Pope Francis' 2015 encyclical, Laudato Si, Care for a Common Home, which is a call to care for God's creation. And the encyclical says, and I'm, going, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just um, some parts of it, but it says, some Francis of Assisi reminds us that our common home is like a sister with whom we share our life and a beautiful mother who opens her arms to embrace us. This sister now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods with which God has endowed her. We have come to see ourselves as her lords and masters entitled to plunder her at will. We have forgotten that we ourselves are dust of the earth, our very bodies are made up of her elements, we breathe her air and we receive life and refreshment from her waters. So it goes on to say that beginning in the middle of the last century and overcoming many difficulties, there has been a growing conviction that our planet is a homeland and that humanity is one people living in a common home. And it then says also interdependence obliged us to think of one world with a common plan. The next, the second quote is a statement made by San Salvador Archbishop Jose Luis Escobar Alas at El Salvador's Legislative Assembly in February 2017, where he submitted and distributed to MPs of all political persuasions a Catholic Church led legislative initiative to ban mining in the country. And he said, Life is at stake, life in general, the life of people, plants, and animals. We do this because we are with the people. It is the feeling of the population and that is why we're here. 
the charge's position is not for or against any political party, but in favor of the people who are interested in the common good. And the third and final quote is from a Salvadoran woman interviewed about her participation in a pilgrimage organized by the Catholic Church in El Salvador in August 2019. The pilgrimage, which was an inaugural event of celebrations marking the anniversaries of Archbishop Romero's birth and his canonization a few months later, abounded with banners calling for environmental care. The woman saw the pilgrimage as a good opportunity to remember the legacy of Monsignor Romero and to pray for peace and the care for our common home. And she also said, these spaces help us to learn more about the message of Monsignor Romero and to put it into practice by showing solidarity with our brother's pain. It is the duty of all of us to protect our land. And I believe that if Monsignor Romero were alive, he would be the main caretaker of the environment. All three quotes, should be read in the context of the period predating the 2017 ban on mining passed in El Salvador, as well as its aftermath. Opposition to industrial mining, which emerged in northern El Salvador, brought together local populations and NGOs from this area. And, and the banner that you are seeing is one um, from, uh, th th that was elaborated by local populations from the northern regions of El Salvador. And it brought together these um, local populations and NGOs with national NGOs, grassroots and human rights organizations and the Catholic Church. As you may have noticed, I have added emphasis to those instances where different conjugations of the commons have been employed in the introductory quotes, whether as everyone's home, the common home or the common good. The mobilization of notions and discursive practices of commoning have cropped up among some of the peasant and rural populations of El Salvador, as well as the NGOs and human rights organizations concerned with environmental deterioration with whom I have worked. I thus seek to trace the roots of such development, which are contributing to an emerging ethics of care for the environment in various parts of Central America. Since the 1990s, there has been a return to rethinking and politically mobilizing imaginaries of the commons in various domains from environmental to digital. In the context of environmental mobilization, this common impulse marks an attempt to contest the economic valuation of territory and more than human entities affected by extractive ventures such as mining. To invoke the language of the commons is, as anthropologist Arturo Escobar suggests, to invoke a different way of seeing and being a different model of social natural life one that reinvents the economy within society and nature. It involves a transition at the ontological level when offering different imaginaries of the more than human, imaginaries that consider the commons not as a resource held collectively, but as a relational cosmovision and practice, and as an altogether different way of governance that places interdependence and ontological continuity at its very center. And this, I would argue, resonates with some components of the eco-theology that has found ground in the papal encyclical Laudato Si, but which actually has a longer theological trajectory. Laudato Si responds to efforts by the Catholic Church to develop an eco-theology that would find broad appeal among ordinary people on the ground and would generate an imperious Catholic moral stance vis-a-vis -vis the most pressing ecological challenges of our time. The first papal encyclical to directly address environmental concerns, Laudato Si builds upon interventions in that direction by the two previous popes and prominent Catholic theologians. However, the encyclical also constitutes part of a global trend towards greening religion that has been playing out across faith since the 1980s. This global greening of religion um, shares, some scholars have highlighted, uh, an integral approach to nature, which in Catholic social teaching and the Bible encyclical takes the form of integral ecology. This is a comprehensive approach to the contemporary social environmental crisis that is explained as follows in the encyclical. And the encyclical says, it cannot be emphasized enough how everything is interconnected. Just as the different aspects of the planet, physical, chemical, and biological are interrelated, so too, living species are part of a network which we will never fully explore and understand. 
And a good part of our genetic code is shared by many living beings. It follows that the fragmentation of knowledge and the isolation of bits of information can actually become a form of ignorance unless they are integrated into a broader vision or reality. And it also goes on to say, nature cannot be regarded as something separate from ourselves or as a mere setting in which we live. We're part of nature, included in it, and thus in constant interaction with it. The strategies for resolution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature. In contrast to Christianity's anthropocentric underpinnings, Laudato Si takes the steps to overcome the nature-humanity dualism and to reinterpret the reading of Genesis that has justified uh, humans' objectification and domination of nature. It draws on San Francis of Assisi, ecologist patron saint, to adopt a stance toward the more than human that resonates with Donna Haraway's call to make kin with other, other earthly species. And in Donna Haraway's words, to um, to, to say, to make with, become with, compose with the earthbound. Pope Francis refers to this when he writes in the encyclical. His response to the world, referring to St. Francis of Assisi's response to the world around him, was so much more than intellectual appreciation or economic calculus. For to him, each and every creature was a sister united to him by bonds of affection. That is why he felt Call, call to care for all that exists. The poverty and austerity of St. Francis were no mere veneer of asceticism, but something much more radical, a refusal to turn reality into an object simply to be used and controlled. The encyclical falls short of fully overcoming anthropocentrism, yet it introduces an ontological continuity and interdependency between the human and the more than human that until now has been largely identified with indigenous cosmovisions. Although acted upon by humans, nature is conferred with intrinsic value by the encyclical, which states that, and, and I quote here also from the encyclical, these situations, referring here to the anthropogenic plundering and environmental destruction, have caused Sister Earth, along with all the abandoned of our world, to cry out, pleading that we take another course. As Bruno Latour has noted of the encyclical, in attributing to the earth the capacity to express emotion and loudly voice pain and implore chains, the encyclical hence considers that the earth, and here I quote from him, becomes a power to act, a capacity to suffer, to be hard, to groan, the urgent presence of a new entity. The encyclical's integral approach does not only confront the modernist separation between nature and humanity, it also highlights the need for a structural transformation that attends to and gives priority to the most vulnerable, a preferential option for the poor that is rooted in liberation theology. The encyclical takes the view that our environmental crisis cannot be addressed without simultaneously acknowledging and addressing poverty and inequality, including the unequal distribution of climate change sequela. Paraphrasing liberation theology, theologian Leonardo Boff, it suggests that there is a need to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. In the land of Archbishop Romero, canonized in 2018 and popular known as Saint Romero of America, this aspect of Laudato Si's integral ecology has deep reverberations and partly explains local take up of the papal encyclical. This is especially the case in the northern areas of the country, such as Chalatenango and parts of Cabañas, where during the 1960s and 1970s, ecclesial-based communities offered progressive interpretations of the Bible and exhorted many not to resign themselves to inequality or a lack of human dignity. Areas of Chalatenango and Cabañas were repopulated before the end of the war by Salvadorans who had fled and spent much of wartime in refugee camps in border zones of Honduras. And what you are seeing in this slide is the banner um, sewn by one of those communities telling the story from the war uh, to the moment where they flee to Honduras and then the repopulation um, back in the 1980s. So they, they, these communities develop forms of communal social organizing in order to self-provide health, education, and food security for the whole, for the whole of the refugee population in the camps. 
When the possibility of returning arose in the late 1980s, these refugees negotiated to repopulate parts of northern El Salvador as a collective subject, a community, rather than as individual refugees. During the post-war era, many of these populations have strived to maintain the social organizing and strong community bonds of that era, though they have faced difficulties as the country has transitioned to a surface economy in which rural areas are no longer economically productive. It is therefore not surprising that Lauda Tosi has acquired common currency among locals who had previously embraced the lexicon and practices of the commons and among prog progressive priests and lay people, some of whom still preach according to the principles of liberation theology. Their embrace of Lauda Tosi is especially understandable understandable given the urgency of environmental issues in those areas such as extraction-based development or the scarcity of fresh water for human consumption. Interestingly, as evinced by the introductory quotes, Laudato Si has been embraced by the hierarchy of El Salvador's Catholic Church, which is aligned with its ultra-conservative branch Opus Dei. But the fact is that with water stress and other environmental issues profiling high on El Salvador's public agenda, conservative sectors, political and religious alike, have been impaled to take, to take a stance. And the best example of this was the 2017 Catholic Church-led legislative initiative to ban mining, which the Archbishop himself brought to the Legislative Assembly, as I mentioned at the beginning. So to conclude, in line with voices claiming the environmental, the environmental consciousness raising cannot be limited to the dissemination of flat scientific facts, but requires deep-rooted changes in societal values, the Catholic Church and the, the leadership of Pope Francis has taken on the, the mission of engendering an ecologically sound form of spirituality. Whether it succeeds in promoting an environmental ethic will depend on local or underground take-up. In parts of Central America, with a history of emancipatory ideologies informed by the syncretism of Catholic social teachings and socialist ideals, conjugations of the commons informed by eco-theology are becoming increasingly popular and fostering an interest in practices of care for the earth. Salvadoran citizens participating in grassroots organizations and NGOs, some with a guerrilla past or a Catholic church connection, have vertebrated post-war environmental mobilization and disseminated notions of the earth as a commons to be cared for through an altogether different ethos. So thank you so much. I'm going to leave it here and I look forward to questions and to the discussion. Perfect. Thank you very much. I know that's a, a great start to the panel. So our next speaker is going to be Cassia Mika, who's a lecturer in comparative literature at Queen Mary University of London. Um, she's worked at the University of Amsterdam and the Royal Netherlands Institute of Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies. And our monograph, Disasters, Vulnerability and Narratives, Writing IT's Futures, turns to concepts of hinged chronologies, slow healing and remnant dwelling, offering a vision of open-ended Caribbean futures. Um, she's produced um, In Tranquilites. I, uh, it sounds like a film which was funded by the AHRC and co-authored Untimely Crises, Chronotopes and Critique. Um, and she's published in the Journal of Haitian Studies, Moving Worlds, Modern and Contemporary France, and the Area Journal. And today, her paper is entitled uh, Crafting Hopeful Futures in the Meantime, Environmental Crises and the Caribbean Beyond a Tropical Apocalypse. So over to you, Cassia. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone, all the speakers. And I'm sure we can draw many points of connections between the Latin American case studies and now the Caribbean, where I want to take you to in the next 15 minutes. Also drawing maybe a bit more on poetry, a bit more on critical black thought to think about the question of apocalypse and the uses of apocalyptic discourses when thinking with crisis. So the dominant ways in which the Caribbean as a region is often presented is either as a paradise for those who can afford, for example, a trip on the Eden luxury travel that you can see on the right, tempting us to go to the uh, Grenadines, for example, or a paradise lost more commonly and for more people in the Caribbean who have to face creeping 
or rather uh, drowning plastic pollution alongside the thundering arrival of tropical storms, nor these the earthquakes. And we can think again on, ha on about Haiti today in the anniversary of the earthquake and thinking and those who experience in that so-called paradise loss, the slow violence of exploitation and environmental exhaustion. And today I want to take those kind of two coexisting images of the Caribbean to think about and pause in between in the meantime. And I want to kind of pause in the corridors before the descent to hell or the ascent to the paradise and work towards a joint environmental humanities and eco-theology approach to those imaginaries of crisis and futures from the Caribbean as a starting point, but not stopping there. And I want to invite us to think about lives beyond what Martin Munro calls the tropical apocalypse, or equally not limiting ourselves to the wait for some sort of magical, sudden ecological redemption. So this is kind of linked to much uh, broader question, methodological questions for many of us who work with crises and long-term crises in these regions is, after Catherine McKittrick, to think with the analytics of life and think about ways in which here poetry and forms of Black critical thought already enact a prophetic freedom work, already trying to put forward a decolonial poetics that envis envisions a decolonial future and, to quote Catherine McKittrick, Black disposition as a question mark, not a full stop. So in, in the kind of first move, um, I want to first build on the work on Stefan Scrimshire and also invite everyone to move away from the kind of eventedness of the apocalypse. So move away from the predictions, when will the apocalypse happen or whether it has already happened and to think about the embodied but also agency full experience of living in and through apocalyptic time. We can think with Greg Beckett's work on ordinary disaster or unlivable life, or maybe for some of us, Rob Nixon's work on slow violence. But I want to really think about that kind of experience and also really point to the asynchronicity of environmental crises. Predictions of when things happen only make sense if we would share environmental time. This, of course, is not the case. And as we know, some regions are already much kind of farther along the way of crisis than others. So this is kind of the first move. And linked to that is, of course, that second broader invitation uh, visible in Catherine McKittrick's work, of course, in Christina Sharps and many others to think about analytics of life, what that would mean to, to think, think about ways of analyzing crisis without giving into, consciously or not, images of exhaustion and and black death and black geographies more broadly, as it is the question for Catherine McKittrick. And then um, this work here builds on, a, on my kind of much longer engagement with Kamau Brafwif's poetry, with Haitian poetry. And today I just want to point you to some of the kind of uh, bits of it in formulating that kind of prophetic work of progress. So in his Negus Kamau Brafwaves in this kind of prophetic mode has this insistent refrain that you can see hopefully on the screen throughout the, the poem, throughout each stanza he writes, it is not, it is not, it is not enough. To, at some point to kind of finish off, it is not enough to be silent, to be semicolon, to be semicolony. This kind of insistent poetic of protest is, I think, uh, a really a powerful call against some of the positionings of the Caribbean in terms of that kind of disempowered apocalyptic zone. And here for a moment, I want to pause with the questions of the apocalyptic present. So often, for obvious reasons, to highlight the urgency of things, to highlight the complexity of environmental crisis, apocalyptic tropes are being used in, when speaking about the environmental situation in the Caribbean, but also more broadly. Martin Monroe's work, for example, um, he writes about you know, Caribbean functioning as and I'm quoting, as a presage of a broader catastrophic collapse, a window onto all of our apocalyptic futures. And he calls that kind of the tropical 
apocalypse. However, in this analysis and in many others, you know, there's this tension uh, between kind of urgency and disempowerment because the apocalyptic functions overwhelmingly in visual and rhetorical terms as primarily synonymous with distraction and total collapse. Elsewhere in the book, he writes about apocalyptic city, referring specifically to the devastation of the 2010 earthquake. And in this reading and in many others, environmental optics of the apocalypse, the narrative arc of the apocalypse as a text, as a collection text, is flattened and stops at distraction, is not kind of taken account of in its entirety. Elizabeth Delory, in her work of allegories of the Anthropocene, also points to some of the limitations that come with certain uses of the apocalyptic when she writes, and I'm quoting here, that it's really important to turn to the non-spectacular ecological violence, right? To think about the long durée, not just the kind of the spectacular. Stephen Scrimshire, in his investigation of the use of apocalyptic discourses, unpacks this in even greater depth, writing about this tendency to use um, you know, the spectacular again. And I'm reading here from his work, what emerges is a clear tendency to strip references to apocalypse of their theological nuances to their more sensational sorry, elements. It is the notion of fear of future events that is assumed to be the common denominator. And again, he, he had that it's usually those visually compelling biblical scenes, in particular climactic portrayal of sudden and imminent climatic catastrophes that are kind of most used without giving kind of enough attention to those theological, ethical, and philosophical nuances that the text brings and its dual ability, which I will highlight throughout this presentation, to inspire optimism and pessimism in relation to human action. He writes, if, it, if we are to take the apocalypse and its theology seriously, we must think about the legacy of Christian apocalypticism is in its ability to attract both pessimism and optimism with regards to human action. And echoing Zizek, echoing Jean-Pierre Dupuis, uh, Scrimshire asks us to think about apocalyptic life, uh, apocalyptic time, as believing that everything has changed. We live with a sense of the inevitability of some of our worst fears, but we may resist the temptation to interpret this as the lure of prediction for some final catastrophe. So again, we see this, what I want to emphasize, this kind of importance of this dual potential to inspire pessimism and optimism and action, not stopping at distraction, not using apocalypse as synonymous with distraction only, rather engaging with its full narrative arc and also the prophetic kind of quality, quality of the text. And linking this specifically to the Caribbean, of course, one cannot think about the apocalypse nor environmental exhaustion without thinking about histories of colonialism, of middle passage and um, ongoing, um, ongoing violence against black lives. Here we can think of the poetically beautiful work of Christina Sharp and earlier uh, Catherine McKittrick's work, which underpins Sharp's meditation on the wake. In her plantation futures, McKittrick calls all those kind of geographers and all those who are interested in thinking about plantations geographies to really focus on that question of analytics of life. She writes, for those of us interested in addressing race, space and premature and preventable death, plantation futures demand decolonial thinking that is predicated on human life. And thinking about that, is kind of uh, linked to bringing forth a poetics that envisions, envisions a decolonial future, future modes of being that might hinge on a decolonial poetics that reads black dispossession as a question mark. Here, I think it's a huge task in, in front of us when thinking about uh, crisis, when thinking about you know, my own work on disasters, how to put an analytics of life which would undo some of the black disposition, which, will, which would kind of work towards formulating those decolonial poetics. 
And I think some of the work from Kamau Brafo, which I already referred to, does that in poetic terms. After this insistent stanza, when he said, writes, it is not, it is not, it is not enough, comes the gesture, this kind of, again, echoing biblical struggle between David and Goliath, comes the gesture flinging a stone. The poem speaker exclaims, you know, fling me a stone that I will confound the void, find me the range, and I will raise the colony, fill me with the words, and I will blind your God at Atibon Legba, the closing call to Papa Legba, the God of the crosswords, crosswords in, in, Haitian, in Haitian voodoo. And it is this flinging of the stone, this anger, this range, that is already that kind of prophetic action of working towards some form of justice. It is also this gesture that is being echoed in another poetic work by Guyanese Martin Carter when he writes also in a, in a kind of a longer poetic work which traces the development of the poem speaker's kind of identity from a subjugated self to an empowered self, kind of halfway through the poem. The poem speaker writes, you know, that their scorn will be, you know, he will fling it in the face of those who hate me, welding my flesh in freedom. And then towards the end of the poem, the poem speaker writes, I come to the world with scars upon my soul, wounds on my body, fury in my hands, to the world of tomorrow, I turn with my strength. And putting this kind of affirmation of welding my flesh to freedom alongside Kamau Brafway's call, I must be given words to shape my name to the syllables of trees. I must be given words to refashion futures like a healer hands. I think both together capture some of that kind of I think embody some of that decolonial poetics that I think McKittrick is, is uh, kind of inviting us um, to, to explore and that I think is necessary if we are um, to undo some of the epistemic um, dispossession of the Caribbean. So really thinking with the prophetic is what I've been kind of trying to do in the last, um, in the last minutes or, um, of, or so. And, you know, as much as we uh, uh, live in the kind of wake of the disasters and wake kind of the aftermath of colonial violence, as Lanixi Welcome also makes clear, this wake, this time of aftermath is equally the kind of the aftermath of revolutions. And in her work in Small Acts, she writes about how the now, the, what I call here the meantime, already prefigures some of that building of the transformative infrastructure. Welcome writes, I'm quoting, true liberation can be achieved only if we raise the stadium. But onwards, we also need to recognize the already present ways people are already building this transformative in infrastructure in the face of repeating disasters within the Cab Caribbean, whether they see themselves as explicitly part of a collective abolitionist liberatory project or not. And this kind of already building in, in the now, in the face of repeating disasters, is what welcome in her work calls freedom work. And in poetic terms, this is what I think Brathwaite and Carter have been doing. And it's now up to us to think how we can kind of translate that into an analytics of life when thinking with disasters, environmental change and exhaustion in the Caribbean. So to, to wrap up, I was really inviting us to think with those two notions of the prophetic and freedom work. And really by so doing, engaging with the full arc of the of the text of the apocalypse. Um, in the epilogue of the, of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, we read, do not seal up the prophetic words of this book for the appointed time is near. And decolonial poetics as embodied in Carter, Brathwaite, and, and analytics of life that we're invited to pursue in our work are also those moments of working towards this appointed time, this appointed time of justice, but a time of justice that is prefigured and starts with that fury in one hand, with that flinging of the stone, with that deconstruction of language. And that might not have just one moment where everything ends with a bang. Or as James Noel, the Haitian poet writes, and I'm translating, everyone knows that one day a new dawn will come, but we don't know at what time 
it depends on your watch. And I hope this call to the attention of to asynchronicity and the prophetic work of the now we can bring forward when we think about ecology and environment in the Caribbean. Thank you, everyone. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, so we'll forge ahead because we, we still have um, two more excellent papers to come. So our next speaking speaker is Adriano Godoy, who got his PhD in social anthropology at the State University of Campinas. And he's now a postdoctoral fellow at the Brazilian Center for Analysis and Planning and associated researcher at the Laboratory of Anthropology of Religion. And his paper today is entitled Ethnoecological Architecture in the Catholic Amazon. So over to you, Adriano. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. The presentation I have prepared is about the research project that I recently started as a postdoctoral fellow at the Brazilian Center for Analysis and Planning and it is supported with the grant provided by the Sao Paulo Research Foundation. My interest in developing this research arose when I came across some news that caught my attention. First, the local news newspaper, Gazeta do Povo, highlighted the statement that Brazil will have the first indigenous cathedral in the Amazon funded by the Vatican. Then, days later, it was the nationwide Geon News website that brought the headline that Architects from Paraná accomplished their project for the construction of the first indigenous church funded by the Vatican in Brazil. That same week, Pope Francis had supervised this project. He authorized the start of the building works and had already guaranteed half of the estimated value for construction of the temple in the Yanomami indigenous territory. I follow the news about the indigenous cathedral with great interest because I observed in this event some parallels with the research I then was developing in the shrine of the Aparecida in the countryside of the state of Sao Paulo. In that shrine, I was interested in how the Catholic modernization of the first half of the last century materialized a religious center attached to the Brazilian national identity. In the Amazon, on the other hand, the Catholic Church proposed to produce a temple with the Amazonian face, not the face of the generic indigenous that shape the nation, as I see in Aparecida, but of a specific indigenous ethnic group, the Yanomami, as you can see in the image, the map. This modernization is evident in these reports that bring a similar narrative. According to them, the request for a new temple has come from the indigenous people in the Maturaca community. It's, uh, some, it's a village inside the Yanomami you know, indigenous territory. Showing images of the recently approved project, the media explains that the new temple will have a circular shape with a diameter of 32 meters, it's around 108 feet, and uh, eight of 25 meters, around eight two feet. Inspired by Chapono, as you can see in the image on the right, there are circular village houses made with straw and wood, and they are traditionals of Yanomami people. This temple will accommodate up to 500 people. As a priest representing the National Council of Bishops for Liturgical Matters said, the project has an identity. It was designed exclusively for that people. It's not just another church. This work intends to serve as a light in the middle of the Amazon. It's hope and it's the face of tomorrow. The project for the new temple was designed for the Yanomami people. Therefore, it is a project with an uh, inculturated identity. In the words of the priests and the architects, two white men specialized in Catholic liturgy, the, construction, the constructions is under the supervision and the administrations of the Salesian congregation. No, for the century old traditions of religion missions among Amerindian people. The Salesian have been carrying out missions among Yanomami since the 1950s. It's not a new mission. However, this project funded by the Vatican takes on new forms and it develops within the framework of a more recent movement in the Catholic church for the entire Amazon region. 
a movement that brings ecology to the fore as the religious protagonist. Uh, integral ecology has been a recurring theme in the speeches of Pope Francis. He inaugurated this Catholic category in the first encyclical he authored in 2015, Laudato Si, on the care of our common home. In this text, he indicates the desires for the beginning of his pontificate and calls on Catholics to engage in the environment cause worldwide. The Argentine pontiff argues that earth is the common home created by, by God. Therefore, it would be the primary task of human beings to act as their guardians, specifically in the face of the climate change. However, unlike the encyclicals of his predecessors, Pope Francis makes a, an outcry as a social environmental manifesto, but without outline norms or guidelines for action. I understand that the Synod of Bishops for the Pan Amazon region, convened by the Pope in 2017, South precisely outlined these action plans specific to the Amazon region, based on this initial outcry of the encyclical. The synod took place in October 2019 at the Vatican and had at its motto Amazon New Path for the Church and an Integral Ecology. On that occasion, it was promoted as an assembly of bishops working in the Amazon region and events bringing together missionaries and representatives of indigenous peoples from Brazil, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela, Suriname, Guyana, and French Guyana. More specifically, the Synod, there was an effort to adapt the post-conciliar guidelines, more focus on land and social inequalities to the Amazon context specificities. This accommodation was carried carried out by reorientating re the pastoral agenda to respond to the ecological demands that have gained public prominence in recent decades in much of the globe. As it is well known, in the case of South America, environmental activism has become one, one of the most significant agendas in international relations, especially in Brazil, since its territory contains most of the Amazon rainforest. Thus, if the governments are continually and progressively demanded internally and externally to develop actions aimed at to protect this biome, the Catholic Church has also become a protagonist in this issue, developing a model of environmental activism. Not by chance, it was during the Synod that the Catholic Church announced the Indigenous Cathedral construction project. The various undertakings outlined there had a goal to trace a series of objectives and methods of evangelization for the Amazon region. However, the national press reported that the Brazilian government's authorities were not happy about the event. They alleged that the event would attack the national sovereignty, that it was a left-wing political agenda, and it was not representative of the majority of the Brazilian Catholics. After a month of working groups, conference, seminars, and audience, a final document was published compiling the assembly's deliberation ratified by the Pope. The paper emphasized that the action fronts are transnational and have the purpose of take care of our common home, that is the planet Earth, and more specifically, in this case, the Amazon rainforest. However, the document emphasized that the Catholic Church should only act as a, an auxiliary line of the native peoples, the true protagonists and holders of ecological knowledge. Deny a new colonial evangelization while admitting to having practiced in the past, the document proposed an inculturated discourse for a church with Amazonian faith. In this way, it suggests an indigenous theology carried out by missionary agents who, enriched by the intercultural encounter, are capable of promoting integral ecology. The construction of the indigenous cathedral constitutes an interesting case to investigate these articulations between Catholic indigenous and environmental practice, as it's present as one of the first and most significant materializations of a social environmental project developed by the Catholic Church in Brazil. Such a position does not come without new tensions. After all, the constructions of new, a new Catholic temple financed by the Vatican 
designed by architects from Paraná within an indigenous territory in the middle of the Amazon rainforest, sounds so many as a challenging contradiction. A contradiction in, inherent to the ecological and, and colonial proposal, propositions described by them. Although it also finds supports in many segments, were religious or not. Thus, in my research, the architecture of the indigenous cathedral will be the guiding threads of the contradiction, in so far as it proposed to give the same religion form to contemporary conceptions, Catholic conceptions of ethnicity and ecology. To approach this post-synodal practice, which the future cathedral intends to materialize, I will converge interests, reflections, and debates present in three different fields of study within the anthropology of religion. That, that of ecological spiritualities, Christians' missions, and material religion. Due to time constraints and considering the panel's theme, I will discuss the first approach of the project in this presentation. The anthropological literature on ecology in Brazil has a research tradition more focused on New Age religions, precisely because of it is greater, its greater affinity with envir environmental issues. Among these forms of spirituality, experts indicate an individualized and body-centered religious performance. In the present case of the indigenous cathedral, focus on Christian religion, I propose to analyze the articulation between Catholicism and ecology through the lens of ethnicity. By sharing large parts of the vocabulary and guidelines of an ecological imagination, I consider that the cyclical Laudato Si and the Pan-Amazonian Synod indicate, above all, the Catholic movement in, in tune with the spirit of the time of the pluralist societies. But unlike New Age spiritualist movements, the Catholic Church claims a deeply Christian gene genealogy of her ecological agenda. This Christian genealogy can be seen in the proposal of Latin American Episcopal Conference that formulates the idea of integral ecology, far for pitching individualized self-care, Catholic ecology is thought as a socially and political engage. This often brings the Catholic Church closer to some non-religious organizations that are committed to the same guide, guidelines. Thus, I'm interested in how the Catholic Church adopts these ecological issues that guide its social environmental uh, policies in the Amazon context. I want to look in how the Catholic Church seeks to establish itself as an institutionalist ecological subject in this globalist ecological enterprise. I will investigate how this indigenous cathedral is an ideal case to see how the Catholic Church articulates religious process of imagination, development, creativity, landscape transformation, and power struggle. However, this process must be contextualized. These religious projects are developed in regions where missionaries Practices are already well established, which requires an effort to re-elaborate and re-signify old conceptions by the new proposals and actors. To extend that to indigenous cathedral will be built in a specific context, that of the Salesian mission. What has long been a reference to most ecological similar proposal and inspires this actor, architecture is the so-called theology of enculturation, a term extensively explored in the anthropological literature. For this, the analytical solution will be to keep the notions of culture explicit in the indigenous cathedral in its ethnic proposals. I will consider how the ethnic, that is what is characterized as belonging to the indigenous people, appears and is mobilized by the priests and the indigenous groups. However, it's worth noting that the focus of my analysis is not the religious institution nor the indigenous ethnicity themselves. Instead, I'm interested in exploring the fruitful and anthropological terms, space of cultural mediation that the constructs of the church will provide. This mediation in the anthropological literature on Christians' missions has historically thought of the missionaries as the mediator for excellence. Going in a different direction, in my work, I choose the temple as this mediator. More specifically, I want to observe how the indigenous cathedral constructions process can produce convergence between notions of ethnicity and ecology in promoting what I call an ethnoecological Catholicism. 
When mapping the actions of these Catholic institutions, it's interesting to investigate the engagements that the indigenous cathedral may promote. On the one hand, I will ana analyze this engagement in terms of the persuasions and contestations that the social environmental actions of the Catholic Church, when this matter seeks to align with progressive and the colonial guidelines in Brazil. On the other hand, I will also be looking into how the temple engages the notions of ethnicity and ecology and promotes an ethno-ecological religion through this public mon monumentality. And that's it. Thank you very much for your, your attention. And thank you, Adriano, and another um, fascinating paper um, and uh, just an excellent case study and excellent timekeeping. All the speakers so far have been brilliant on that front. Um, so we have one more paper before we can we can move to your questions. Um, so our final speaker is going to be Gabriel Bayari. Um, who I believe is presenting work prepared by himself and Amy Whitehead. Um, Gabriel is a PhD candidate in uh, anthropology at the Complutense in Madrid and Macquarie University. Um, he's a specialist in political anthropology um, with a particular focus on nationalism and the far right in the Latin American context with a, a, a specific emphasis on the Brazilian case. And today he's presenting a paper titled Decolonizing Mary, a material approach to social and environmental justice in Latin America. So over to you, Gabriel. So many thanks for the opportunity uh, to come along and present on the subject of a current research project that uh, is under development. So I'm going to present the project that we are working on and will be very, very useful to have your, your feedback. Um, we have teamed up uh, because this project aims to bring the growing fields of belief and material religion into conversation with political anthropology. So Amy Whitehead is unable to join us today. Um, unfortunately, so I'm going to present both of us. Uh, she prepared uh, a, like a huge part of this presentation and the paper that uh, I'm going to, to read. Uh, so Amy is a both religious studies scholar and anthropologist of religion, uh, whose expertise is in the field of material religion, where she has focused on statue devotion, animes, and ritual studies, specifically in relation to contemporary pagan contexts and Marian statues in Andalusia, in Spain. Um, and I am a political anthropologist whose research is on the far right in Brazil and the religious connection as you were explaining uh, before. So um, this current project was conceived out of an encounter that Amy Hyde while uh, doing research in Andalusian Spain. Uh, she had encountered a religious statue called uh, La Virgen de la Regla in a nearby town called uh, Chipiona. Uh, then she traveled to La Habana in Cuba where she encountered another Virgen de la Regla uh, only this time, the statue was both Virgin Mary and Santeria Goddess uh, Yemanja. So, this phenomena is, of course, interesting on several fronts. For example, um, it speaks uh, to discussions about African diaspora traditions, about religions transformations, and is a good example about how livid or vernacular religion works. It goes beyond syncretism to create something new, volatile, creative, and relational, uh, what uh, uh, Bettina Smith refers uh, to as a religious bricolage, and highlights the significance of the roles of material cultures in these transformations. So the current project that we are working on and currently applying for funding uh, for expands this focus on Cuba and Brazil. And in the line uh, with current thinking in the field of material religion, we place religious statues such as La Virgen de la Regla and the Virgin de la Caridad, Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre, who is also Oshun, or in the case of Brazil, La Virgen de la Candelaria, who is Yemanja, at the center of our investigations. So these figurines will act as lenses through which uh, we can discern and understand a whole range of post-colonial indeed neo-colonial processes. Um, so let me speak a little about um, the premise of uh, this current project. 
Um, in Latin American and Iberian countries, the Virgin Mary is venerated as a source of nationalist, local identity, divine assistance, and political resistance. Um, it's a figure of hope in the uh, Anthropocene. Uh, Mary sits at the forefront of many of Latin America's, indeed, the world's most pressing problems as climate change, social and economic inequality, indigenous rights, pandemic, and non inclusive citizenship. And while the significance of the roles of living religion in managing perpetuating and resolving this crisis is acknowledged, the significance of the roles of material religion have been underestimated. That's like the, the point uh, that we are trying to, to put in the center, the, the, the focus on the material religion for their research. So this research project combines political anthropology with material religion to offer a unique material approach that utilizes religious status of Mary a site is from which to understand how global problems are negotiated by communities at local levels. Um, so again, we are using statues at the starting point for understanding wider social phenomena and as points from which to test this idea and ask how do religious statues give shape to demands for social and environmental uh, justice. So in other words, we are uh, reimagining religious status as sites for articulating how global problems are understood and managed at local levels in the different, in the different political contexts of Cuba and uh, Brazil. Um, yeah, now as Amy found from her research in Spain that religious status play hugely significant roles in their communities. And this is no different from what is known so far from in Latin American context apart from the fact that their identities are a result of encounters. Specifically, uh, we speak about uh, the Catholic and African traditions that result in African derived religions. And some of the common features are that these statues are fixed and ever present in times of crisis. So they provide healing as well as support and protection during critical political and social processes. They facilitate beneficial agricultural cycles or fishing and they are the sources of community cohesion rituals and feast days. Feminine religious figures are always associated with food and food related practices too. Perhaps there is a connection with a kind of mothering there. And they also listen to the muted voices of the poor and marginalized and are often the points around which political action is mobilized that we were, we were, were seeing in uh, some of the last presentations. So stage uh, deities in Cuba and Brazil govern rivers, mountains, natural processes such as hurricanes and the sea in ways that Spanish um, statues uh, do not, such as the sea uh, goddess uh, Yemanjá in Brazil. Um, so let me, yeah, pass here to the next, okay, here. So, uh, I'm going to speak about the sites. Yeah, uh, based on uh, the team's expertise, we will undertake research at four key sites uh, where two African goddesses, Oshun and Yemanja, meet Catholic status of Mary. Uh, so this, this both, as I was saying, Oshun and Yemanja. So in the case of Cuba, uh, we research uh, La Virgen de la Caridad in Santiago, uh, with Mary and Santeria goddess Oshun. Uh, that, as you know, is the goddess of rivers, love, and associated with processes of revolution and Cuban nationalism. Um, in the case uh, also of Cuba, we will study La Virgen de la Regla in La Habana, who is Catholic Mary and the African goddess uh, Yamanja. And in the case of Brazil, we will study like regional variations of the same deities in Rio de Janeiro and Salvador de Bahia. Um, so, yes, the Virgen de la Candelaria, for example, that represents Yamanja. So we believe that there is a value at looking at these material meeting points or intersections at which uh, colonial, African and indigenous worlds meet, which makes them ontologically fascinating. They really are border objects that house different ontologies and epistemologies. But we believe that these statues can reveal new understandings, not only about religion, change and post-colonialism, they also invite to creative development of some interesting theoretical and methodological approaches to current social and ecological crisis. Um, let me speak a little about the justification of these places. 
Um, the choice of the comparative framework of Cuba and Brazil is justified through two main channels. First, uh, both countries, as you know, have expressive presences of Afro religions, and that, that's the point that we are we are focusing. And second, both countries uh, were once Catholic colonial metropolis uh, based on plantation economies, and both are currently living through pivotal moments of political and religious transitions in their post-Castro and Lula's Lulis, uh, eras, and represent contrasting political ideological faults that influence their approach to religions. So Brazil is experiencing the rise of a far right, uh, evangelically driven reactions uh, that attacks local expression of religious diversity and multiculturalism, while Cuba is experiencing a moment of flexibilization that values the unique Cuban uh, as a category and thus national character of Afro-Cuban religiosities as replacements for the political oriented hegemony imposed by the Catholic Church. So specific questions to explore in this uh, research. Uh, the first one is how do statues facilitate resistances against uh, colonial and hegemonic discourses? The second, do statues articulate different worldviews that resonate with Latin American concepts such as Buen Vivir and the Sumax? And the third, uh, in what ways do epistemologies of the South enable us to rethink Eurocentric discourses on well-being that recognize the relationship between material religion, healing, ritual practices, and social environmental justice? Um, so this is like the three main, main questions that we, that we have. And about the methods and fieldwork, um, we will take the form of participant observation at shrines, processions, and political protests. Uh, we will really be focusing on eliciting the voices of people and their personal experiences and narratives about their relationship to the statues and their places. So interviews and just general hanging out will be key. Um, we will also like to do some ethnographic filming with groups and individuals and hopefully produce a suite of uh, short films um, so we are also exploring the possibility of a material digital approach that will combine these more traditional methods with the social networks analysis of contents generated on social media platforms as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, so that's um, the ideas that we are that we are um, thinking about. And just to conclude, uh, reimagining religious statues as sites for understanding global problems at local levels not only offers creative, theoretical, and methodological opportunities. Mapping statues using a material approach creates a model that can initiate global conversations that respond to the history and present of social and environmental justice and injustice and the wider and ongoing effects of colonization through Mary's changing phases. So thank you so much. And as uh, we are speaking, uh, it's a project that we are trying to develop more. So it would be great to have your, your feedback. So thank you so much. Welcome back. Oh, and welcome to the highlight of our conference. So uh, I must say that I'm delighted to have Professor Virginia Garat as our keynote this evening. Uh, her scholarship combining meticulous historiographical analysis with ethnographic research methods exemplifies very well the, the interdisciplinary dialogue that this conference aims to promote. Her work also demonstrates how fruitful these interdisciplinary encounters can be. Virginia Garat is a professor of history uh, at the University of Texas, Austin, and past director of the Lilas Benso Latin American Studies and Collections. Well, I must say that it's very difficult to, to summarize Professor Virginia's accomplishments. Historian of religion and renowned uh, Latin Americanist, she has authored several books, edited collections, journal articles, exploring the intersection of religion, culture, ethnicity, and politics in Latin America. In 2010, she authored the disturbing terror in the land of a Holy Spirit, Guatemala under General Efraín Bios Montt, 
where the book analyzes Guatemala's brutal armed, armed conflict mobilized by the Pentecostal dictator General, uh, General Rios Montt through his religious uh, vision for this new Guatemala. Professor Virginia Hagat's most recent book, uh, Face of Gods in Latin America, Emerging, Emerging Forms of Vernacular Christianity, has already became uh, an essential reading in the field of world Christianity. By shedding light on how global religion and local culture interact and focusing on how ordinary people actually understand and practice faith in Latin America, faith of, uh, of God in Latin America forces us to rethink Christianity as a non-Western religion. This evening, we have the chance to hear Professor Virginia uh, Garat uh, current elaborations on uh, authoritarianism and Christianity in the paper entitled Restoring the Kingdom, Authoritarianism and Christian Nationalism in the Americas. Well, uh, Professor Virginia Garat, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you so much. It is a real pleasure to be here. And I was honored to be asked to be a part of this event. And certainly as your plenary speaker is a great honor. Uh, and I wish I could be there in person because um, it just sounds like a, an outstanding conference. And so I hope that um, there will be an opportunity to um, at least read papers from it. It's so nice to see some familiar faces here too. So um, thank, all, thank all of you for, for participating. But speaking of faces, I think you probably don't want to look at mine the whole time that I present. So I have a PowerPoint presentation for you and um, let's, let me share it with you. So thank you. All right. Um, since the evangelical boom that began in the 1970s, social scientists have long anticipated the emergence of Protestants and Pentecostals in particular as a powerful political force for change in Latin America. With a few exceptions, this has not been the case. Latin American Pentecostals, by and large, have tended to remain a fugamundi outlook in their outlook, framing their moral constructs in terms of the church and the world. They have historically regarded the church, the world outside the church as a demonic and dangerous place with which evangelicos or evangelicos, depending on which language you're speaking, should avoid at all cost, except through evangelization and prayer. But this is changing with the emergence of a new hermeneutics of political engagement known broadly uh, as the Christian right, a loose movement that works to bring a network of conservative self-fashioned Christians, and I will actually use scare, quote, scare quotes around that because I think it's debatable whether they really are, usually Pentecostals to political power in order to affect dominion over the earth to restore an imagined Christian past in order to prepare for Christ's return. Although its most visible pro proponents and some of its roots are in the United States, this is a global movement hidden in plain sight much of the popularity of Donald Trump among American evangelicals is granted in the principles of the Christian right. And over the past decade and a half, the movement has become quite widespread and significant across Latin America. Manifestations of the Christian right in the Americas, and I include the United States as part of Latin America uh, in this analysis today, are simultaneously sui generis and transnational, an internal contradiction like many of the others that honeycomb the movement. Despite the US-centric focus of much of the movement's discourse, its intellectual roots have been deeply entangled in the region from almost the beginning. As Benjamin Cowan has elegantly shown in his recent book, Moral Majorities Across the Americas, <clears throat> he says, we, I quote, we must recognize what people in the United States, Brazil, and farther afield think of as the right comes from many places and sources and that Brazil, which is a focus of his book, is home to a religious right at least as significant and influential as that of the United States. And that has, it has long held pride of place in the world of event, world evangelicalism and the genesis of Christian conservatism, Catholic as well as evangelical. And as a historian of Guatemala, I believe that that Central American nation could make equal claims. Building on Cowan's definition, the fundamental pillars of the Christian right, broadly speaking, are this. They are anti-modern, anti-liberal, anti-ecumenical, anti-state, while supportive 
of authoritarians who they believe represent what they call apostolic interests in a big government that protects them, anti-rational, anti-scientific, and anti-egalitarian. The Christian right is also highly identitarian, enamored of mysticism, in the case of Catholics, or pseudoscience, in the case of evangelicals, and drawn to occulted knowledges that often include an embrace of conspiracy theories. Adherents nurture a strong attachment to an idealized, often highly racialized mythic past. Above all, they feel aggrieved, alienated, and besieged by the many challenges and changes that the 21st century has brought to bear. These are cultural, demographic, biological, climatological, virological, you name it. Make no mistake, <clears throat> the Christian right is a political movement, fundamentally, first and foremost. But what makes this laundry list of grievances titularly Christian is simply the framing of a political set of solutions in a religious, familiarly Christian idiom that conveys a comforting authority and seems to invest moral value in political goals that might otherwise read as overtly tendentious, racist, anti-democratic, and even seditious. The object of this talk, then, is to shed light on the hydra-headed Christian right movement that goes by various names, representing subtle tendencies within a single current um, known as Christian restorationism, dominionism, or Christian nationalism. It's not an exaggeration to say that this, collectively, is one of the most influential, unrecognized, and potentially violence engendering political movements that threatens democracy and freedoms of various kinds across the Americas today. And you may wonder why I have a picture of a South Asian woman with a long braid. I, I like to think of uh, the Christian right as braided together like this, that the parts are separate but inseparable. Um, so that's sort of the metaphor that, that I, I wanted to share with you. Because our time is not infinite today, we will look mainly at one specific node of the movement known as Dominion Theology, which despite its name is really more a methodology of Christian restorationism than a theology per se. Dominion theology is a theocratic belief that at the, that a prophetic moment in history, Christians are destined to take over society. That is to have dominion, as described in the book of Genesis, by taking control of its political and social institutions, first through vigorous prayer and then through direct political and social action. There is great urgency in this mission to restore what they view as a deeply fallen world to God's righteousness, correcting all errors and sins along the way. In specific term, the core values of the Dominion Restoration include reification of private property and capitalism, nationalism, although of a sort that isn't necessarily bounded by traditional national borders, a deep veneration of traditional culture, as they define it, the rejection of ethnic and religious pluralism or multiculturalism, a discouraged rejection of modernity from the Enlightenment to the present, which covers a lot, an abjurance of secularization and atheism, an abhorrence of abortion, same-sex marriage, and LGBTQ plus rights, and a detestation of communism, which more than three decades since its apogee in the West, in this context, generally means anything that smacks of an interventionist or social democratic state. Dominionism is a liturgical uh, task affected through prayer, prayer and supplication, but it is also concrete work that demands careful political slating of candidates, the creation of alliances and compromises with politicians and secular political entities. And that requires, as do all political movements, a sophisticated ability to analyze and capitalize on fast moving political trends, careful <clears throat> polling and expertise in voter manipulation. And let me pause to say, I know you can't read this screen. <laughs> I can barely read it and it's on mine, but I want you to see um, why I've chosen to discuss just one aspect of the Christian right, because uh, dominionism sort of is an umbrella term that embraces all these different things that appear in this chart. And please do read uh, a definition of it by uh, over here on the left. Okay. Only then after the selection by election or otherwise of true Christian leadership, which is they call apostolic governance, can true restoration begin. Biblical law must replace secular codes. Christian values again form the basis of the educational system and all social, sexual and political relationships must conform to biblical precepts, including Old Testament ones. 
including those which are paternalistic and non-egalitarian, but which promote a, and I quote, beauty of e inequality in the words of one of Cowan's subjects that mimics a much older conception of social noblesse oblige. In short, consistent with all other aspects of Christian nationalism, dominionists seek to restore a nostalgic imaginary so-called Christian society where godly, white men benignly, even benevolently <clears throat> control the lives of women and people of color and of all others in alignment with retrofitted conceptions of what is traditional and conservative values. This godly formula, they believe, is assured to bring about a total transformation. This is a term of art that will usher in a new age of peace, prosperity, and Christian benevolence to their troubled societies, their nations, and the global community at large. And these are the spheres that they seek to be active in. They, they call the, um, it's, it's called the Seven Mountain Mandate. And so they, the Dominionists want to reclaim all these seven categories of um, society. And you can see it's pretty comprehensive business, government, family, religion, media, education, entertainment. Um, I would add probably in some way, I would add a couple more mountains <laughs> regarding uh, gender and, and uh, race. But these are the basic ones they use. It was during the 1980s with the rise of the Moore majority and the coalition of conservative Christians that helped Ronald Reagan to the US presidency when the advocacy and mobilization of conservative Christians doing what they do best, praying and attempting to bring their own version of the kingdom of God to the world began to gain unprecedented momentum. During the 80s, the Central American crisis provided an ideal testing ground um, <clears throat> for this activist theology, pinpointing Guatemala, a country that at the time was undergoing a significant boom in evangelical growth. There, a born again general, Efrain Rios Montt, was leading his scorched earth campaign against leftist insurgents in the dominant Maya population, a project that killed at least 100,000 people and pursued the Maya as internal enemies of the state. At the same time, dominionist pastors and missionaries, along with church growth specialists, predicted that Guatemala was poised on the threshold of what they call La Hora de Dios, <clears throat> its kairos, its prophetic moment and its tipping point when large scale prayer and conversion to Protestantism would allow the troubled country to undergo wholesale transformation to a new Guatemala, a coined phrase by Rios Mon himself, who was a recent convert to the Iglesia Cristiana Verbo, a neo-Pentecostal and Dominionist influenced church. And Rios Mont's vision delivered weekly on television and what were probably called his Sunday sermons, his Nueva Guatemala was providentially destined to become a shining city on a hill, a covenantal nation hallmarked by an obedient, God-fearing, prosperous and Mestizo-led society. This new Jerusalem was to guide its citizens by biblically mandated rule where communist deviance and secular values could never again gain purchase. The darling of then President Ronald, US President Ronald Reagan and of conservative US evangelicals, Rios Mont was an early forerunner of dominionism in action and an antecedent to the likes of Brazil's Jair Bolsonaro, Donald Trump and other leaders of the Christian right who would be waiting in the wings nearly half a century later. And I will say, I've written a book, as Manuela described so nicely, about Rios Mont. And even after years of looking at him, I couldn't put him in this template until fairly recently to sort of see what the long through line really is. Rios Mont's overthrow in a military coup in 1983 in his conviction in 2013 for genocide and crimes against humanity committed during his tenure in office eventually took the starch out of his reputation as a Christian soldier for dominion and compelled his conservative Christian um, <clears throat> supporters in the US to eventually take their distance from him. Although he retained, remained a popular figure among conservative sectors in Guatemala for the rest of his long life. But even Rios Mont's very public downfall, scathing, damning, and ultimately toothless, did nothing to sully the Christian right movement in Latin America. To the contrary, it became all the more prominent by the turn of the century as neoliberalism, 
shifting sociocultural mores, immigration and displacement, late day capitalism's inequalities, climate change, disease, and the overripe tropes of modernity all brought ever more disenchantment. All these factors have contributed to widespread discontent, a sense of social displacement, hopelessness, and enemy, and not only among conservatives or evangelicals, nor are these forebodings unique only to people who live in Latin America. These same factors have engendered in ordinary people an attraction to new kinds of solutions that they perceive as drawing from tried and true formulas and sources of authority, truth, and moral probity. Uh, 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 distillation that has been promoted very actively and successfully by the Christian right. As a result, the Christian right with dominionist leanings presently enjoys rising prominence across much of the hemisphere and indeed other parts of the world. It's especially influential in Peru, and I wish I'd heard these earlier papers. I'm sure there were many things I would have liked to have learned from it, from them. In Peru, in Colombia, present day Guatemala, Costa Rica, in the coup in Bolivia that overthrew Evo Morales in 2019, and even in Mexico and Nicaragua, two nations led by leaders, or in the case of Nicaragua, autocrats, with heretofore <clears throat> uh, impeccable leftist secular credentials. But perhaps most significantly, significantly conservative evangelical support contributed to the rapid political rise and election of the far right former military officer turned born again Christian while remaining a Catholic, confusingly, Rogério Macias Bolsonaro to the presidency of Brazil in October of, of 2018. Bolsonaro, who many aptly refer to as the tropical Trump or the Brazilian Trump is outspoken, bombastic and authoritarian. His ferociously anti-immigrant views, his gloves off law and order mentality, his outrageously and unapologetic, misogynistic, and homophobic statements, his disdain for Brazil's majority non-white population, his enthusiasm for combating his political enemies through violence and even assassination, and his flagrant disregard for democracy do not actually on the face suggest much in the way of a Christian outlook. And yet, despite Bolsonaro's enthusiastic misanthropy and racism, his strong anti-corruption stance, his profoundly conservative views on gender and sexuality. Make him, these things make him a popular populist figure among conservative Brazilians, even those well outside the Dominionist Pentecostal community. <clears throat> Bolsonaro has also won the favor of Brazil's most prominent and influential evangelical leaders. This includes the strong support of Ajay Macedo, the founder, and head pastor of the enormously influential neo-Pentecostal domination, Grecia Universal do Reino de Deus. And you all have probably already talked about him ad nauseum today, but here we are. Um, uh, <clears throat> to wit, on September 1st, 2019, Macedo formally, formally presented Bolsonaro to God and to his vast congregation at the IURD's showcase temple, Templo de São Mão in Sao Paulo. The pastor of one of the world's largest major <clears throat> mega churches offered his blessing on the president, declaring him to be consagrado, profetico, and a leader filled with the Holy Spirit. On this occasion, the diminutive Macero placed his hands on the kneeling Bolsonaro so as to anoint his head with holy oil, ordering him to, and I quote, lead the beloved country in the name of Jesus. Macedo, who's not just a pastor, but a leading Pentecostal prophet, a media mogul, and an ardent dominionist, Mark Bolsonaro is one divinely chosen to shepherd the South America's largest nation to apostolic governance, which will in turn lead to the, the transformation of Brazil and far beyond Brazil. The incongruous of Bolsonaro's words and actions with the teaching of Christ do not trouble his evangelical followers, whose pastors, <clears throat> echoing the words of their counterparts in the U.S. in regard to Trump, assure them, and I quote, that God works through flawed men, men, it is men, not humans, <laughs> God works through flawed men, <clears throat> a recognized contradiction sometimes known by evangelicals as the King David paradox. Although the Bolsonaro administration has been plagued, literally, by the coronavirus, 
a slump in world trade, climate change, and its own many missteps, both self-inflicted and unintentional, Bolsonaro himself continues to believe Macedo's prophecy. Borrowing a tactic from Trump, his homologue to the North in September 2021, Bolsonaro, mindful of his abysmal polling numbers, warned his supporters that the upcoming 2022 presidential election would be, I quote, a farce and assured evangelical leaders that he would leave office only by force or death. I have three alternatives for my future, he informed them, being arrested, killed, or victory. But the latter outcome, he is confident, is guaranteed. Only, as you can see here, only God could ask me, he reassured the pastor. This phrase recalled Rios Mont's own assurance to Guatemalans, and I showed you this in 1983, that God put me here. Such is the conviction of dominionist grace and favor. With such an anointed leader in power and with an environment that increasingly condones division and intolerance, it's perhaps not surprising that some of Brazil's Pentecostals expect and are receiving something substantial in return for their support. There was a noticeable upspring in violence related to religious intolerance prior to Bolsonaro's rise since around 2016, but in 2019, the Rio Base Comercial de Combate a Intolerancia Religiosa recorded a 56% increase in religious violence that in that one single year. The majority, though not all, <clears throat> since some Catholic charismatic groups have also been accused of such actions. Of these events consist of assault by Pentecostals, most often members of Macedo's congregation, the IURD, against practitioners of Afro-Brazilian religions, particularly Candomblé Umbanda and the Matrishma Africana, the breadth of African-based faith, <clears throat> generally speaking. Although these are entirely illegal, these sorts of confrontations have become commonplace in practice with absolute <clears throat> impunity in areas of Brazil where Afro-Brazilian religions are most widely practiced, such as Natal, Sao Paulo, Salvador Bahia, and Rio de Janeiro. They have also increasingly become an accepted part of the Pentecostal spiritual warfare repertoire and a hallmark of dominionist success. The influence of dominion theology, however, is not limited to right-wing demagogues. It finds its prophets and apostles and left-wing populists as well. We look no further than Mexico. I just I actually have in my notes here, just south to Mexico. I live three hours from Mexico, but y'all don't. So anyway, look to Mexico, one of the countries of the longest tradition of anti-clericalism in most severely secular states in Latin America outside of Cuba, if also one of the most resiliently Catholic. Even yet there, the election of leftist Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, uh, AMLO, in 2018, witnessed a strange pairing of Mexican socialism and the Partido Encuentro Social, which you'll notice the initials spell out PES is in the Christian fish, right? No accident there. An influential political organization founded and headed by Hugo Eric Flores Cervantes, a Harvard educated Neo Pentecostal pastor of Iglesia Sobre la Roca, which is a base of fierce moral conservatism and expressly dominionist principles. PES joined AMLO's Iremos Historia coalition in, in June. 2017 helped to assure his election has been very influential uh, since. Pace in the church that backs it actively opposed legal abortion as well as pornography and same sex marriage. Uh, one of its members actually said, and I, it's sort of horrendous, um, she actually said that a same sex marriage law would, and I quote, permit Mexicans to marry, uh, could go so far as to permit Mexicans to marry dolphins or their laptops. Anyway, um, Pace's absorption into uh, AMLO's Moreno party signaled a conservative turn in AMLO's sexenio to the extent that some commentators have taken to calling the president, long known for his progressive politics, un conservador desfrazado de liberal. <clears throat> In January 2020, AMLO proposed a national referendum on whether abortion should remain legal in Mexico although the Supreme uh, Court eventually ruled that that referendum was unconstitutional, using abortion as a bellwether um, <clears throat> of conservatism, although in Latin America it does read differently than it does in other parts of the world. 
even more astonishing, though, in um, uh, Amlo has also introduced the uh, something called the, he's holding it in his hand. There's something called the Cartilla Moral, which is something that he he proposes that Mexico create what it calls a new moral constitution, uh, and the Cartilla is actually a book written in 1944 by a man named Alberto Reyes, who um, proposed it as sort of a secular Bible for Mexicans. And AMLO has reintroduced it and has re made it required reading in all, <clears throat> all higher education widely uh, available. In specific terms, it calls for, it's not religious per se, it calls for respect of individual people, their bodies and their soul a respect to families, rec a respect for a human society, um, and respect for the patria, and respect for uh, the natural environment, which is very visionary, actually, in 1944. Um, but this has caused, as you can imagine, a great deal of uproar uh, in Mexico, where church and state have been divided for many, many years. The Mexican intellectual Enrique Crasse has written of AMLO. He reaches directly into the religious sensibilities of people. They are seeing him as a man who will save Mexico from its evils. Even more important, he believes it too. If that provides an entree for dominionists, it is enough in itself. For them, the moment for Mexico's Christian restoration has already begun. So in conclusion, for decades now, Observers and pundits have posited the politics of evangelical growth as Latin America has become more and more Pentecostal, and many knowledgeable scholars have questioned how long it would take for Latin Americans Protestant boom to take an overtly political term. Um, and so with dominionism, does this mean that the buried giant has finally come to life or not? It's important to stress uh, uh, that many Christians, including evangelicals and other Pentecostals, emphatically do not subscribe to dominionism and uh, Christian restorationism, which they believe is a, her a heresy, um, that it's a disgrace to the faith, and it's a, a craven use of Christian idioms and imagery for political gain. Even if they agree on some of the social uh, and cons conservative social issues that dominionism uh, promotes. But... Um, the gist of this presentation is not that Latin American evangelicals have become politically influential because that's only to be expected given their great numbers. But the point is rather that a rather, I call them a stealth minority, it's a large minority, but a minority within Pentecostal Christianity with a very clear agenda and methodology in international networks hidden in plain sight has become a highly influential player within Latin America's political arena. Dominionism and its proponents and detractors both agree has profound implications for the future. The dominion restorationists have proven themselves extremely adept at tapping into deep veins of social discontent and anxieties, especially in the hot zones of race, culture, and above all sexuality. The fact that the prophets and apostles are governed by a specific vision is largely opaque to those outside the movement provides them with a cover that allows them to move expand, and expand their influence in the quest for dominion without, transparent, without transparency of any kind. And above all, they move forward with utmost confidence in the righteousness of their grand plan to restore and redeem not only their countries, but the whole world itself. In the words of Fabricio Alvarado, a leading Costa Rican dominionist, even a televangelist, who ran a surprisingly close second in the past presidential campaign and is running for president again after learning he lost said doesn't matter what happened our praises should go to god and we are calm that our message did win the elections so i will close with the word of jesus as they appear in the king james bible he that hath ears ears to hear let him hear so thank you